Good morning, and thank you very much for attending the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedoms hearing today on religious freedom, violence, and U.S. policy in Nigeria. I would like to thank our distinguished witnesses for joining us today, sharing their expertise. The U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, or commonly known as USERF, is an independent bipartisan U.S. government advisory body created by the 1998 International Religious Freedom Act or IRFA. The commission uses international standards to monitor freedom of religion or belief abroad and makes policy recommendations to the United States government. Today, USERP exercises its statutory authority under IRFA to convene this virtual hearing. For today's hearing, we'll be discussing the impact that instability and violence by non-state actors is having on religious freedom condition in Nigeria and how the United States government can adjust its policy approach to ameliorate the situation for religious or belief communities in the country. Now I will turn the floor over to Vice Chair Cooper for his opening remarks. Thank you very much, Chair Turkel. I would like to join in welcoming you all to today's hearing. In 2020, prior to my time on the commission, I myself traveled to Nigeria to engage with religious communities there and learn about the challenges they face. Most recently, in June of this year, USERF sent a delegation to Nigeria to conduct research on mm -hmm. religious conditions there. Nigeria is currently facing a myriad of security crises. Among the broader human rights ramifications of violence in Nigeria, some of this violence mm. impacts the rights to freedom of religion or belief. For example, in some regions, militant Islamist groups, in the course of their insurgencies, conduct violence targeting non-Muslims, as well as Muslims who disagree with the group's interpretations of Islamic law and practice. Identity-based violence at times manifests at the intersection of religion, ethnicity, and geographic heritage, with certain ethno-religious groups being targeted as supposed outsiders or attacked for the land and social capital their group is perceived to possess. Mob justice, quote-unquote, has threatened individuals who express beliefs other that others consider blasphemous. And across the country, as I heard directly from eyewitnesses and survivors, perpetrators target worshipers, sacred ceremonies, and religious leaders, and threaten those congregations' rights to worship collectively and in public as protected under Nigerian and international law. Today, we aim to not just discuss these limitations on religious freedom in more detail, but to really get at the heart of what the US government can and must do to help alleviate the situation for Nigerian faith and belief communities and ultimately improve religious freedom conditions in the country. USERV consistently recommends that the State Department designate Nigeria a country of particular concern for engaging in and tolerating systematic, ongoing, and egregious religious freedom violations. We also call upon the United States government to appoint a special envoy to the Lake Chad region to prioritize a holistic approach to these issues and ensure the full weight of the US government is centered on addressing them. I'm very personally appreciative that these hearings are being convened and that we have the opportunity to hear directly from people uh, in Nigeria as part of these hearings. I now return the floor to Chair Turkel. Thank you, Vice Chair Cooper. Before we turn our, to our distinguished witnesses, I want to ask Commissioner Davy, who led the most recent USERF delegation to Nigeria this summer, to share some brief re reflection from the visit to frame our discussion. Uh, Commissioner Davy, floor is yours. 
Thank you, Commissioner Te Chair Turkel, and thank you to everyone for joining our hearing today. Discussing the religious freedom implications of violence in Nigeria is, needless to say, a mammoth task. As we dive more deeply into the discussion, I want to frame the conversation with a few reflections from my June trip there, as, as Chair Turkel mentioned, where I spoke with a diverse variety of religious, civil society, and government stakeholders. First, uh, in the tenuous Nigeria context that I think we all are aware of, religious minorities and individuals with dissenting beliefs or interpretations are being forgotten or excluded from the religious freedom dialogue, or so it seems, at least to, to me and to us, based on the recent visit. For example, few stakeholders uh, we met with during that visit discussed the cases of humanist leader Mubarak Bala and Tijaniya Muslim musician Yahya Sharif Aminu. Yusuf has highlighted these religious prisoners of conscience in our meetings and actually I uh, have adopted them as my religious prisoners of conscience in the USERF Religious Prisoners of Conscience program. But we highlighted these religious uh, prisoners of conscience in our meetings, yet they still remain relatively absent from Nigerians' discussion regarding freedom of religion or belief. Both men are detained on charges of blasphemy for expressing their dissenting beliefs. And so I employ all those fighting for freedom of religion or belief in Nigeria to remember that we cannot ignore or sacrifice those with minority or dissenting beliefs, dissenting beliefs in our fight to quell violence and religious freedom violations in the country, in Nigeria. Nigeria must be safe for all religious and belief communities and be a country where religious freedom flourishes. Second, it is important to note that it's not just freedom of religion or belief that is under attack in Nigeria, but many human rights protected under international law. USER focuses specifically on the right to freedom of religion or belief, but we recognize also that in Nigeria, as, it, as is often the case, violations of this right correspond with other types of human rights abuses and atrocity risk factors. Today, we've engaged a diverse array of experts to help us build a holistic approach to addressing the drivers of violence impacting religious freedom in Nigeria. Finally, I want to highlight that one of the main findings from USERF's research delegation to Nigeria is that poor governance plays a major role in driving violence and instability. Many of the people with whom we spoke from across Nigeria's religious spectrum reported that the Nigerian government could be doing more to address institutional failures and weaknesses that have led to a culture of poor security and judicial sector performance that then leads to impunity for violence, including violence against religious communities. It is because of this violence as well as the issues outlined by Vice Chair Cooper, that, the, that USERF has repeatedly recommended, most recently, April 2022, that the State Department designate Nigeria as a country of particular concern, or CPC, pursuant to the International Religious Freedom Act of 1998. We hope the State Department's list of CPC designations that is, expe that is expected later this year will once again include Nigeria. With these reflections, I return the floor to Chair Turkel to introduce our witnesses. Thank you, Commissioner Davey. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we appreciate your leadership in our efforts to promote and protect relig vulnerable religious communities in, um, in Nigeria. With that, I'd like to introduce our first witness um, for today's hearing. Uh, Ms. Oge Onobugu uh, is a director of the West Africa program at the US Institute of Peace, where she leads programming in Nigeria, coastal West Africa, uh, Lake Chad Basin, and Gulf of Guinea. In her current position, she provides leadership and oversees 
the design and implementation of projects to mitigate violent conflict, promote uh, inclusion and strengthen community-oriented security by partnering with, partnering with uh, policymakers, civic leaders, and organizations. She's also in the public leadership credential program at Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, Ms. Onobugu, you may begin your testimony. Thank you, Chairperson Turkel, Vice Chair Cooper and Commissioner Davey, as well as members of the US Commission on International Religious Freedom. Thank you for holding this hearing on Nigeria and for the work that the commission is doing in ensuring a focus on human rights and religious freedoms around the world. My name is Ogi Onobogu. I am the director of the West Africa program at the US Institute of Peace. The US Institute of Peace was established by Congress over 35 years ago as an independent, nonpartisan national institute to prevent and resolve violent conflicts abroad in accordance with US national interest and values. The US Institute of Peace has been working in Nigeria for over a decade and has a country office in the capital city of Abuja. USIP's work in Nigeria brings together state governors, national policymakers, and civic leaders to design and implement inclusive policies that mitigate violence and strengthen community-oriented security. While my testimony today is informed by my work with the US Institute of Peace, the opinions and recommendations expressed are my own. Nigeria's overlapping conflicts, including the insurgencies in the North, secessionist ag agitations in the South, and intercommunal violence have killed thousands of people and displaced hundreds of thousands. During the first half of 2022, insecurity intensified in Nigeria with an overall rise in violence targeting civilians around the country. These ongoing crises, plus pervasive corruption and violent crime are rooted in a disconnect between governance and citizens. The surge in violence, criminality, and other forms of insecurity since Nigeria's 2019 elections heightens the risk for the upcoming national and gubernatorial elections in Nigeria scheduled for February and March 2023, respectively. This turmoil poses acute risk to Nigeria's election campaign season which officially begins today, September 28, for the presidential and national assembly elections. According to data collected by the Armed Conflict Location and Event Data Project, ACLED, political violence by communal and ethnic militias and their violent activities targeting civilians constituted over all incidents reported in Nigeria in the first half of this year an increase when compared to the same period in 2021. The escalation of political competition and political violence ahead of next year's elections cannot be understated. The intersection of violence and political context contest only sharpens the urgent imperative to strengthen the ability of Nigerians to resolve local conflicts non-violently. In Nigeria, religion intersects and interacts with ethnic identity, region, social class, and profession. Nigeria's protracted violent conflicts between farmers and herders is an example of this complex intersection. After 61 years of independence, Nigeria still struggles to cultivate a national identity rooted in people's basic freedoms and dignity. Although Nigeria's constitution and other declarations of national purpose formally guarantee those freedoms and dignity, those promises are routinely held meaningless, often by the same state that is meant to uphold them. Nigeria's political leaders romanticize Nigeria's unity, but do little to cultivate it. To the contrary, they often stoke ethnic and religious tensions, especially during election campaigns. There is also violence in Nigeria with exclusively religious motivation, such as the recent occurrences of blasphemy killings in May 2022, 
Deborah Yakubu, a college student, was killed by a mob in Sokoto State in Northwest Nigeria after being accused of blasphemy. Addressing the increasing violence in Nigeria requires, requires a nuanced understanding of its underlying intertwined drivers and the role of identity, including religion. Given this complexity, it is important to understand when religion is used as a tool to mobilize violence and when violence is exclusively motivated by religion. In the context of Nigeria's unstable environment and the upcoming 2023 elections, incomplete information about the conflicts could risk policy, program responses, and public statements doing more damage by intensifying rather than de-escalating the conflict. Now it goes without saying that US action to support Nigerian peace building and atrocity prevention efforts is the right thing to do, and it is in the US, it is in our interest. A US-Nigeria partnership focused on honest dialogues that promotes peace building amid conflict can help sow in Nigeria the vital conversations that will be a key source for real solutions. To be clear, the United States cannot pre pretend to offer solutions as we have our own challenges, but it can change old practices that fail to advance dialogues that Nigerians can use to reverse the country's long and now dangerous slide into dysfunction. Here are some recommendations that the US government can and should do to support these efforts. First, focus on accountable governance. Nigeria consistently moves from one violent conflict to another. The country's leaders and international partners, including the US, often become fixate, fixated on the latest manifestation of insecurity. The larger problem, however, is that none of this will ever change unless the focus turns more firmly and consistently to the thread that runs through all of these crises, the failures of governance. A common thread underlying many of Nigeria's most pressing problems and violent conflicts is a failure of governance, a disconnect between government and citizens. There is a need to reinvigorate and sustain a focus on getting governance right. That means ensuring better mechanisms of accountability for top government officials and reducing corruption and other abuses that fuel, that fuel violent conflict. Second, timely, constructive, and consistent support to the 2023 elections and the political transition to come. Nigeria is only a few months away from elections that could strengthen or set back its democracy. On the positive, there is a surge in voter registration and a wave of civic engagement among young and new voters who in recent years have often been despaired of better governance through elections. Still, that very frustration and the demand for change combined with tenacious campaigns by existing political parties to hold onto or retake power and the already volatile tensions across the country also risk electoral violence that could dash hopes and fuel greater outrage. The US government already provides robust technical support to Nigeria for elections, but political support is equally crucial. The coming months offers opportunities. President Buhari just attended the UN General Assembly meetings this month and we can presume that he will also attend the US-Africa Leaders Summit scheduled for December. US diplomats should emphasize to him and the Nigerian government the importance of maintaining his pledge of guaranteeing elections that carry the prospects of another commendable milestone in Nigeria's democratic development. Third, prioritize local peace building and atrocity prevention programs. Violent conflicts in Nigeria have been driven mainly by local and state level disputes 
rather than by nationwide divisions, a history that magnifies the importance of local level peace building. Like any other peace building initiative, the, this, these engagements must be shaped by detailed understanding of how different communities in Nigeria perceive conflicts and also understand peace in their communities. Third, work more, fourth, work more with Nigeria's states. Nigeria's, Nigeria's 36 states hold significant power in the country and they also warrant specific attention. America should decentralize its engagement with Nigeria by strengthening its dialogues and engagements at the state level with local governments and with civic leaders at the local levels. Shifting America's partnership more towards Nigeria's states is vital to the work of ending Nigeria's dozens of armed communal conflicts. Finally, pursue constructive and honest partnership. US engagement must center more on Nigeria's citizens, notably the 70% who are younger than 35. America's engagement with Nigeria's citizens, America's engagement with Nigeria is often with its centers of power the states and institutions and corporations that dominate Nigeria's oil production and its financial industry. But real engagement requires Americans and others to now see that there are two Nigerias. There is a deep divide between the country's power centers in the capital cities and the more and the 100 and the other citizens, many who are younger than 35. There needs to be a more open and focused dialogue with this more youthful population. Neither the United States nor any other partner can truly help Nigeria recover from its decline unless there is a focused and energetic engagement with these groups of with this group of Nigerians. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Ms. Onobugu. Um, now we will ask our next witness, uh, Dr. Osulu Olusola Isola, to, uh, to provide his testimony. Dr. Isola is a senior research fellow in the Institute for Peace and Strategic Studies at uh, University of Ibadan, Nigeria. He was the spring 2018 visiting African build, uh, peace building fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington. Uh, he holds PhD in Peace and Conflict Studies from the University of Ibadan. Uh, with that, I'd like to ask you to begin your testimony, Dr. Isola. Looks like we're having technical difficulties. Um, Dr. Isola's testimony, written testimony, will be available on our website uh, after the hearing. I invite uh, participants to go and read it. Uh, now we're going to move on to our next witness, uh, Mr. Emmanuel Ogbudu. Um, Mr. Ogbudu is a humanitarian and development expert with nine years of experience providing technical expertise to multi-million dollar donor-funded projects. He's currently the senior monitoring, evaluating, and learning manager for the community initiatives to promote peace and ac peace activity with Mercy Corps in Nigeria. Uh, Mr. Ogbudu, you may begin your testimony. Thank you very much. Uh, riding on the existing uh, protocol, uh, the testimony I'm going to present today is based on the key findings and implication from a Mexico report, uh, report that we titled A Fear of the Unknown, which I co-authored with Adam Lynch Tenheld, uh, who is now based at Stanford University. 
This study was motivated by recent uh, trends in intercommunal conflicts in Northern Nigeria. In recent years, uh, commentators have increased, uh, uh, increasingly heightened the religious dimension of intercommunal conflicts, suggesting that this violence is religiously motivated. Other commentators have emphasized the role of religion and uh, instead characterized this conflict as a consequence of increased banditry and growing resource competition. To help fill the evidence gap, uh, at the heart of this debate, we pose three core questions, which first, we, what are the main drivers and uh, motivation for violence in North Central and Northwest Nigeria? Second, what are the, second, uh, the specific processes by which religion catalyzes violent conflict? And third, uh, what mechanism have communities used to prevent violence and mitigate religious tension? To answer these questions, we drew on multiple quantitative and qualitative uh, data sources to examine broad patterns and trends in violence. We analyzed three different sources of violent event data in 12 uh, states in North Central and Northwest Nigeria over the past 10 years. Uh, Onubogu has talked about the acclaim. We, we referred to the acclaim data the Council on Foreign Relations and Nigerian Watch. We complemented this analysis of violent event data with two phases of field research in Kano State and Kaduna State, respectively. And the first phase, we used 165 in-depth interview with key informants, uh, key informants and local community members in both states to capture qualitative insight into conflict dynamics processes and pathway to violence. The second phase of the field uh, research used a survey of 750 residents in 15 communities across the two states to quantitatively evaluate the factors associated with individual support for and willingness to participate in violence. In this testimony, I want to highlight four key findings from our reports that are relevant to the core aims of this uh, hearing. Our first key finding uh, is that only some violence has been inter-religious in nature and Muslims and Christians have been both perpetrators and victims. Analysis of data from ACLID, the Council on Foreign Relations and the Nigerian Watch indicate that from 2011 to 2020, only 9% of attacks explicitly targeted or were carried out by religious uh, group and only 10% of fatalities were ascribed to conflict over a religious e issues. Uh, this finding from the violent, uh, from the violent events database is supported by our survey data in which majority of Muslims and Christian uh, survey respondent say that members of both faith are responsible for violence in their area as opposed to pinning blame solely on one side. Our second key finding is rather uh, than being driven by religious belief or hatred, violence that falls along religious line is typically a consequence of insecurity and a lack of social cohesion between ethno-religious groups. Our survey data shows that more religious people are, the less likely they are to, the more religious people are, the less li likely they are to support or engage in violence. And this holds across both Muslim and Christian faith. Instead, we found that insecurity and weakened social cohesion combined to lead to violence. An increase in perceived insecurity correspond with a 25 to 35% uh, in respondents' support for the use of violence and their willingness to engage in it. Meanwhile, a decrease in social cohesion, including intergroup trust, is associated with a 43 to 60% increase in respondents' willingness to endorse violence. This dynamic was echoed in our qualitative interview, including by a community leader who described this pattern saying, I call it fear of the unknown because people know uh, that they can be attacked if there is a crisis. Our third key finding is that while we did not find that religious belief or hatred is a root cause of violence, we did find 
evidence that religious identities provide opportunities and motivation for both elites and ordinary individuals to, mo to mobilize violence. I will briefly illustrate both of these pathways of mobilization through direct quotes from our qualitative interviews. The first pathway is that political and religious leaders intentionally politicize or enhance the silence of religious identity to spur people to action, particularly around elections, which create windows of vulnerability by raising the potential for shift in power between groups. An interviewee in Kano, in Kano State, he described this saying, it is a known fact that people are very religious. So if you want to win a Kano man over, use a religion as a cover. This is what most of our leaders are using against us, using religion as a tool to stir up conflict. The second pathway is that members of the public make solid, uh, solidarity, uh, solidarity claims to co-ethnic or co-religionist uh, to garner support in a quarrel, which can allow interpersonal disputes to escalate into conflicts between identity groups. Uh, an interviewee described this pattern saying, conflict starts with something as lead to as misunderstanding between two people of the opposite religion, but later turns into religious violence so that perpetrators can get back up. Our fourth key finding is that although we find that religious leaders can amplify conflicts, they can also be custodian of peace. So the analysis in our report shows that uh, survey respondents who say that religious leaders help resolve disputes in their area are significantly less likely to support violence. This finding holds no matter how often people say that religious leaders are actually successful in resolving disputes. I will close by highlighting, uh, hi highlighting two sets of recommendations that follow from these findings. First, we recommend a shift uh, in how we think and talk about conflict across religious divides away from the picture of a clash of civilization that is a root cause of violence towards an appreciation of the role of religion as a potential catalyst and mobilizer that interacts with uh, other root causes and is deployed uh, strategically by both mass and allied actors. Second, this shift in mindset and framing leads us to recommend a set of specific uh, programming uh, intervention to address intercommunal conflicts in Northern Nigeria. This include interventions that focus on preventing the escalation of dispute into violence by training religious leaders and other local leaders in negotiation and dispute resolution by strengthening local early warning system so that trained local leaders can intervene before dispute escalate and by paying specific attention to windows of risk such as elections. We also recommend interventions that address key roots uh, causes of violence by strengthening intergroup interaction and trust, especially around natural resource management and interventions that address governance shortcomings by increasing the effectiveness and accountability of security and service provision. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. And I'd like to uh, give uh, Dr. Isola one more chance uh, to see if he can uh, join us. Um, I see him um, in the program. Uh, we had, he had some technical difficulties. Dr. Isola, can you, um, are you in a situation to um, provide your testimony or are you still experiencing technical difficulty? Can you hear me? Yes, I'm, I'm connected now. If you can hear me. We can hear you. You may proceed. I don't know if you can hear me. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and the Honorable Commissioner. I thank you for the privilege for making this presentation on religion and politics in Nigeria. It was said by the previous speakers. Nigeria is a multi ethnic religious society with about 250 many religions. In order to sustain the peaceful coexistence among the various religions, 
the, the independent and post-independent should be a secular state with none of the religions taking precedence over or favored over the others by the government. In essence, there should be no state religion and state affairs should be separated from religion. This principle was sustained by subsequent governments and even the various military administrations that are ruled strictly separated. From religion. In Nigeria, the peoples of the country lived some value religious conflicts. Even though there were occasional ethnic clashes and equal conflicts in the late 60s, the first relief as a result of the activity. Dr. Isola, you may want to turn off your groups, camera. That they were suppressed by the extra military government. Since then, they are. In... Dr. Isola, you may want to turn off your camera so that you may have a the more stable connection. Okay. The media published reports of religious conflicts and give accounts of their dimensions. However, in the recent years, the activities of the media in terms of insensitive reporting of religious conflicts have been noticed to have aggravated religious violence in Nigeria. In addition, the mixture of politics with religion appears to have complicated the religious complexities and amplified religious conflicts in the country. <clears throat> Insensitive reporting of religion conflicts has led to spreading of such conflict to other parts of the country. You know, politicians in their quest to cultivate support from the electorate often mobilize the religious sentiments of voters in the process, whipping up negative sentiments among the diverse population. This sometimes leads to antagonism among the diverse religious adherents, leading to violent conflicts among the adherents of. Dr. Isola, you may want to wrap it up. Uh, we have serious technical issues here. Dr. Isola, I'd like to ask you to wrap up uh, so we can move on to the next. Uh, on the part of the media, did the plot political rhetoric the diverse public? Can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, let me quickly wrap up. US government can uh, help in implementing in order to foster religious Okay. Um, Dr. Isola, thank you very much for your testimony. We would we, like to move on to our next. All right. Thank you very much for your testimony. I'd like to move on to our next uh, uh, our final witness, uh, Mr. James Barnett. Uh, Mr. Barnett is a researcher, journalist, and consultant based in Lagos, uh, Nigeria. Uh, and he's also a non-resident fellow at the Hudson Institute here in Washington, DC. His work covers conflict, terrorism, and geopolitics, primarily in Africa. Um, prior to joining Hudson, uh, Mr. Barnett held research and analyst uh, position with the US Institute for Peace, Institute of Peace, the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, and the American Enterprise Institute's uh, Critical Threats Project. Uh, Mr. Barnett, you may begin your testimony. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, good day, all. I thank Chair uh, Turkle 
Vice Chair Cooper and Commissioner Davey for hosting this hearing. Uh, and I thank my three distinguished colleagues for their testimonies so far, which I found very enlightening. I'm grateful for the opportunity today to speak on these important topics regarding security, social cohesion, and religious freedom in Nigeria. And I wish to uh, note from the onset that the views I express are my own do, and do not necessarily reflect the official positions of any of the organizations with which I am affiliated. That said, I am indebted to several of those organizations and my colleagues therein for uh, facilitating this research upon which this testimony is based. So in the interest of time, I will bridge the written testimony that I've submitted and narrow the focus of my work world testimony to discussing some drivers of terrorism in Nigeria, and particularly two sets of militants that have been officially designated mm -hmm. by the Nigerian government as terrorists and are sometimes conflated in Nigeria's political discourse. On the one hand, there are Salafi jihadist militants that have historically operated in Nigeria's northeast, namely the Boko Haram group and its two offshoots, the now stronger Islamic State in West Africa's province, or ISWAP, and the Al-Qaeda-linked Ansaru group. And then on the other hand, I want to talk about the militants known colloquially as bandits, who have terrorized large swaths of northern Nigeria and north central Nigeria in recent years. I've conducted extensive research across northwestern, north central, and northeastern Nigeria on the basis of this testimony. And this includes interviewing both affected communities, state actors, but also non state actors in the northwest, as well as former jihadists who have defected and gone through the Nigerian government's de radicalization process to talk a bit about the motivations of the violent extremist groups to which they previously belonged. To give the bottom line up front, Nigeria's jihadists and bandits are both incredibly deadly and can be quite indiscriminate in their violence against civilians, but their motivations differ in notable ways. While jihadists are waging an ideological struggle rooted in an extreme and fringe religious ideology, Nigeria's bandits are mostly motivated by a combination of personal ambitions and grievances stemming from inter-ethnic conflict rooted in land use disputes to a large extent. In contrast to jihadists, bandits do not generally target civilians on the basis of religion, but in some ways are even more indiscriminate than the, the primary jihadist groups that are operating in, in Nigeria today. I think it's worth uh, explaining very briefly what I mean by bandits, because it's a very vague term. Uh, Nigeria's bandits are a very difficult subset of militants to define, and even the term banditry uh, has some different ge geographic connotations within Nigeria, with uh, Nigerians from different parts of the country using the term somewhat differently. For the purpose of this discussion, I'm focusing on northwestern Nigeria, in which I would define bandits as rural gangs that engage in criminal activities such as cattle rustling, extorting, looting of villages, and kidnapping for ransom, increasingly on a mass scale. Most bandits in the region, but not all, are ethnic Fulani pastoralists who claim to have taken up arms in protest of the government's mistreatment and neglect of herders. While many bandits first turned to militancy with genuine grievances, they have since developed a more criminal modus operandi. Rather than uniting to fight against the Nigerian government, the bandits in the Northwest primarily attack ordinary villagers and travelers. They of rival gangs in their pursuit of wealth, power, and notoriety. Notably, and I really want to stress the point because I think sometimes the phrase bandit itself might also come across as an understatement. There are thousands, possibly even tens of thousands of bandits spread against, uh, spread across dozens of gangs in northwestern Nigeria, and they are so well armed that they have become deadlier than many jihadists. Now, a popular narrative has emerged in many parts of Nigerian society that just the jihadists and bandits are essentially two sides of the same coin. That bandits, being northern Muslims, and particularly being ethnic Fulani, are motivated by a radical religious ideology similar to Boko Haram's. The reality is much more complex. Jihadists and bandits are organizationally, ideologically, and to an extent, ethnically distinct movements within Nigerian context. While jihadists are absolutely motivated by extreme religious ideology, for the bandits, it's ethnicity and the political economy of warlordism that play a much larger role in fueling the violence in that region. The bandits are themselves mostly Sunni Muslim, though they generally demonstrate little interest in religious observance and, unlike jihadists, frequently engage in un-Islamic activities, in quotes, uh, and vices such as drugs or alcohol. Their primary antagonists, at least as they tell it, are the Nigerian state and, in the Northwest, ethnic house of farming communities, as these are the communities that Fulani have come into conflict with over the past 20 years amid heightened and increasingly ethnicized farmer herder conflict. Therefore, in their pursuit of political legitimacy, bandits, and especially the most powerful bandits, who I often refer to as bandit warlords, attack farming communities, and specifically Hausa communities or other ethnic groups, to bolster their claims to be fighting in the name of the Fulani ethnic group. 
even though I should add that many bandits also rob and kill Fulani in their pursuit of wealth and power. The bandits do not seem to care much about the faith of their victims. When bandits operate in Christian areas, they kill and kidnap Christians. But in states such as Zamfara, Sokoto, and Katsina, where the bandits are the most powerful and where the banditry-related violence is most intense, the primary victims of bandits are ethnic Hausa, which is the majority ethnic group. To take one example, Kaduna State exemplifies the complex dynamics of banditry and religion in Nigeria. In southern regions of the state, such as local governments, such as uh, Zangon Kataf, where Christians are the majority, it is definitely the case that there is banditry, kidnapping, arson, and these crimes, and that Christians are the, form the majority of the victims. However, within the very same state, if you move into the western or central areas, into local governments that are predominantly Muslim, such as Birnangwari, or more mixed, such as Chikun local government, there too you will have the same types of banditry, and very often even the same gangs conducting the same types of attacks. In sum, the bandits have a very different modus operandi than jihadists. In fact, while jihadists have attempted to recruit bandits to their ideological cause on numerous occasions over the past decade, Two of my colleagues and I show in a detailed fieldwork-driven study that was published earlier this year that bandits have usually been resistant to the overtures of jihadists. And in the question and answer section, I'm happy to talk a bit about why that is, why bandits and jihadists have not cooperated and converged as much as one might think. Now, before concluding my remarks, I'd like to briefly touch on the Nigerian government's response to both jihadist and bandit terrorism, something that I deal with a, a bit more in the written testimony. A suspicious or conspiratorial narrative has gained track in certain segments of Nigerian society that the federal government, under the leadership of President Muhammadu Buhari, who is himself a Fulani Muslim from the Northwest, is turning a blind eye to, or perhaps even actively aiding, bandits and jihadists as they overrun Christian parts of Nigeria in an effort to Islamize the country. In my own research, I find little evidence to support these theories, which I have seen are often employed for political gain. However, this does not mean that the Nigerian government has fulfilled its obligations to its citizenry. On the contrary, the narrative that the government is failing to protect Christians from slaughter, while true, is incomplete for the very tragic reason that Muslims are also being slaughtered on a daily basis. Civilians, whether Muslims or Christian, bear the brunt of violence in northern Nigeria, especially these days in the Northwest, where the bandits tend to go for softer targets, attacking unarmed villagers or travelers rather than confronting security forces head on. I would therefore recommend to the commission that in looking for ways to improve security, religious freedom, and social cohesion in Nigeria, we must be ever receptive to the local nuance of intercommunal conflict that vary greatly across the country of 200 million people. That's very important rather than reducing Nigeria's complexity to a single narrative. I would conclude this testimony with one rec recommendation, particularly regarding the situation of banditry in the Northwest. U.S. government should do what it can, within reason, to push its partners at the various levels of Nigerian state and society to develop a more coordinated and coherent approach to addressing banditry, terrorism, and kidnapping in the Northwest. Compared to Northeastern Nigeria, there is far more policy dissonance within the Northwest between the local, state, and federal authorities when it comes to this issue of banditry. In general, local and state authorities have proven to be more interested in pursuing non-kinetic options, seeing this crisis as one rooted in intercommunal violence and seeing the bandits essentially as political actors that for better or worse, have a degree of uh, political constituency, you can say. The federal government, on the other hand, has a taken an increasingly militarized response to the conflict in the Northwest, seeing the bandits as originally criminals and now increasingly as terrorists, which while no denying that their violence is increasingly terroristic, the federal government's uh, policy approach ends up not only being in tension with that of the state and local authorities, but they can indeed prove to be very counterproductive, as has been the case on multiple occasions. And unfortunately, it is Nigerian civilians, first and foremost, who suffer the consequences of failed or incomplete policies in Nigeria. With that in mind, this is the one key area where I'd recommend that the United States can nudge Nigeria in the right direction. That is, in pushing for greater policy coordination and coherence on these issues of security in the Northwest. I thank you very much for this opportunity to testify. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Barnett, um, for your uh, compelling testimony. Um, I'd like to recognize, recognize myself for the first line of questions. I'd like to go to Ms. Uh, Onobugu, if I may. Um, Ms. Onubugo, you have highlighted the role of poor governance has played in uh, driving much of the violence 
that threatens religious freedom in Nigeria today. Um, could you say a little bit more about uh, which actors in the Nigerian government are failing to live up to the uh, to their, their du duties, and, and if so, why? And what are the main points of leverage that the United States government might uh, prioritize to in incentivize these actors to improve governors? And finally, why do you think that Nigeria is absent uh, from U United States atrocity prevention policy? And what can we do to rectify this? Uh, thank you, Chairperson Terkel, for your question. I will start with the last point that you, the, the last question, I am not an expert on atrocity issues, so I can come back to you with a response on that. But on your first question on the governance issue, I think Nigeria has had a long history of poor governance. And this is a very complex uh, situation. And we often see spikes in violent activity or political violence as we come into election season, as we're beginning to see a significant spike as we head towards elections, really significant high stakes elections in Nigeria in 2023. I think consistent engagement by the US government and other international partners of Nigeria um, is key, ensuring that we are looking at strengthening institutions of governance and not solely building partnerships with individuals alone, but strengthening the institutions of governance to ensure sustainability. These are institution, institutions of governance from the security side to the justice side, to accountability, because time and time again, the concerns we hear from citizens are about the problems of impunity. For many citizens at the community level, it is clear to many of them who the actors or the perpetrators are in this violence. And when the violence continues and folks are not being held accountable, victims themselves can also end up becoming perpetrators because it only continues to um, fuel a cycle of violence when no one is held accountable. So strengthening the institutions of accountability is key. Strengthening justice and security sectors are key. And when I talk about security sector, it's not only on train and equip, programs. It's really building and strengthening those institutions that can remain sustainable and that are connected to the uh, communities. One of the examples that I put down on the table is to really think about how we engage or how the U.S. government engages at the state level in Nigeria. Nigeria is a federal system with 36 different states. And these are state government, and these states are run by state governors um, that in many instances are almost as powerful as the president and also oversee budgets in some instances that are larger than the budgets of some countries in West Africa. So it is important to think about how we engage constructively at the state level, because we consistently see violence in Nigeria emerging at it, violence emerges at the state level, at the local level, and when it's not managed properly there, it blows up into something national and regional, as we've seen in the case of Boko Haram. Um, one of the, um, interventions that USIP has been carrying on for the last couple of years is working at the state level to strength, strengthen state peace building institutions and state peace building commissions, because these are closer to the communities and they're able to work hand in hand with communities and the state governments to address um, issues as they arise. Now, a lot of work still needs to be done in institutional, institutionalizing peace building and ensuring that it is something that is looked at as a as a part of the government as, as a part of the governing system and not just an activity. And I think most importantly, it needs to be owned 
by the Nigerian people and also owned by the Nigerian state as well. Thank you very much. Now I would like to recognize Vice Chair Cooper for questions or comments. Um, thank you, uh, uh, Chair Turkel. And I, I want to uh, thank and commend uh, the testimonies this morning. I uh, learned a great deal uh, to expand and com further complicate, but in a positive way, our uh, need to uh, do what we can from our end. Uh, my question is, um, Nigeria is a huge target from the outside as well. It's the largest country in Africa. It's the richest. Um, can uh, any of the um, uh, individuals today who are testifying, could you list some of the terrorist groups, uh, both inside and outside the country, and which of them uh, invoke religion? Uh, either as a strategy or as a core motivator of their own activities. Thank you. I was about to defer to James Barnett just to get some information <laughs> from the research that he's conducting on there on, on, on these issues. Thank you. Yeah, um, I cut out for two minutes, I think exactly as um, wh whoever was asking the question asked it. So would you be so kind as to repeat it, please? Sure. Sure. It was good timing. So uh, Nigeria obviously is the largest and uh, richest country in Africa is also a huge target uh, for terrorists. Could you give us an idea of which terrorist groups operate inside Nigeria, which are influ influencing from outside, uh, and also um, which of these groups invoke religion or theology as either a tactic, a strategy, or as their so-called, if you will, core motivator or value? Yeah, thank you very much, Vice Chair Cooper. That's a great question. I think that those, those groups were core Salafi jihadist terror groups. And as I noted, and I'll elaborate here, there are three primary uh, terror Salafi jihadist terror groups operating in Nigeria today. So there's the original Boko Haram movement, which started as a mass preaching movement in the Northeast in the uh, 2000s and was kind of tapping into uh, what was sometimes a relatively kind of Energies, um, this this feeling that uh, Islamic law could bring new uh, kind of tea and deal with issues of corruption in the northern states in the 2000s. This is in the first decade of uh, the era of democratic rule. And then in 2009, Boko Haram transformed permanently into a very violent insurgency. And especially after the killing of its founder, Muhammad Yusuf, by the Nigerian authorities in 2009, the successor to, to Yusuf, the infamous uh, uh, terrorist Abu Bakr Shakao, um, was uh, you know launched one of the, the bloodiest insurgencies on the continent and the one one of the bloodiest jihadist insurgencies anywhere in the world. Um, Shakao, what was kind of what set him apart from even other jihadist terror groups was that he had a very exclusive, very radical interpretation of the concept of takfir, this idea of one Muslim declare another Muslim apostate, such that in Shakao's mind, even the vast majority of Muslim citizens of Eastern Nigeria, by virtue of not supporting Boko Haram, were apostates and were therefore kind of target for violence. And so Boko Haram is actually kind of a liar within the global jihadist community for bombing mosques, for killing lots of Muslims. This is, uh, and, and this is, of course, not to, um, you know, uh, uh, deny the fact that they also engaged, particularly during their Zen probably to 2014, in widespread campaigns against Christians, particularly in northern Nigeria, with some very brutal attacks. But Boko Haram's and Shakao's ideology and strategy was so kind of uh, radical that there were lots of dissenters within the group. So originally, in 2012, you had a called Ansaru that had some hacking from Al-Qaeda, specifically Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. So that's the uh, the jihadist base more in North Africa and the Sahel. We supported this kind of splinter on on the, the understanding that Shakao was too radical. Uh, sorry, that Shakao was too radical and that his leadership style is very erratic. 
So the Amara group, um, while smaller than Boko Haram, engaged in a number of uh, profile attacks, particularly kidnappings of, of Western expatriates uh, in Northern Nigeria in roughly 2020. But by the mid 2010s, they've, uh, they were kind of uh, done away with um, for now. Um, and then the OX formed in 2015, 2016, is now actually the most powerful jihadist group in Nigeria. And so that's where you have the main fracturing of Boko Haram with a number of commanders who had been skeptical of Shekau's leadership and ideology, essentially getting the blessing from the Islamic State, who was saying, you know, this is, of course, the Islamic, one of the most brutal terror groups in the world, saying, yeah, you know, Shekau is too erratic, we can't rely on him. And so you guys should, you know, form your own group and you will have our formal backing and designation uh, as, a, as a prophet. Uh, within the Islamic State. Quote. And so fast forward about six years. Today, it's that Islamic State province, ISWAP, that is the, the strongest uh, uh, province, that, uh, probably one of the strongest jihadist groups in Africa today. Um, if you look at their kind of the rate at which they claim it, if you look at the degree to which they've been able to kind of Direct a proto state in the, the hinterlands and the rural communities in northeastern Nigeria, as well as uh, um, kind of, and so I would say that today ISWAP is the strongest and, and most dangerous terror group. In Nigeria. That said, you still have some elements of the Haram view movement. And I say some elements because it's difficult to know kind of what the leadership structure of Boko Haram is today. Abu Bakr Shakal was killed in May 2021 in clashes with ISWAP, and he doesn't have a clear successor. Uh, one of the areas where it gets complicated is that in the Northeast, there is a group, uh, what's called Bakura fashion, that has kind of claimed the mantle of being the successor to Shakal. And it's operating still in the Lake Chad area, and there's been some on again, off again, fighting with the ISWAP faction for dominant, even though Bakura is much smaller. But what my own research on the Northwest has shown is that a lot of Boko Haram guys, even before Shakal's death in 2021, a lot of Boko Haram fighters had actually started migrating into the Northwest or North states and kind of setting up camp in these smaller cells in the rural areas, and that they were conducting a lot of attacks that maybe, you know, at the surface, they could kind of look a lot like the local banditry. And they weren't necessarily claiming these attacks and in contrast to say ISWAP, which tends to, you know, to, to publicize its, its uh, operations through the Islamic State media network. So I think that today there are actually probably a lot of Boko Haram guys roaming around different parts of the Northwest and North Central. And, you know, there are certain commanders who are kind of rumored or reported to be the, you know, the leaders of these Boko Haram guys in that region. But it's hard to know to what extent they're operating as kind of a unified insurgency versus is it more kind of smaller cells, you know, um, conducting their own attacks in their own areas. Um, that said, some of these Boko Haram guys were behind a, a large, um, a kind of high profile uh, kidnapping of Mr. Barnett, thank you so much. Um, it seems like you're having technical 60 difficulties. passenger traveling from Abuja to the state capital of Kaduna in March of this year. So, oh, sorry. That's, that's okay. I'll, I'll stop that, now then. That's oh, sorry, okay. Bob. That's okay. Um, I wanted to thank uh, the commissioners uh, patiently waiting for uh, an opportunity to comment and ask questions. If I may, I'd like to go to uh, uh, Commissioner Frank Wolf uh, for comments or com questions. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I, I appreciate it. And I want to thank the witnesses. I have a couple of questions, but I'll try to be really brief. Uh, and whoever wants to answer it is appropriate. In a May uh, 31, 2021 article in Foreign Affairs magazine titled The Giant of Africa is Failing, former Ambassador John Campbell and Robert Rodberg said, quote, following, state failure in Nigeria is having profound consequences for the entire region and beyond. It bodes especially ill for the stability and well-being of weak states in Nigeria's vicinity, as evidenced by the spread of jihad and criminal groups to Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Chad, Ivory Coast, Mali, and Niger. What impact is what's taking place in Nigeria having in the surrounding Lake Chad region?
Anyone want to comment? Um, sure, I, I can. I I, I can comment. I can comment on this. Thank you, Commissioner Wolf, for your uh, question. Obviously, um, I, I think that there is a saying that goes that when Nigeria, um, what what happens in Nigeria impacts uh, the the entire region. When Nigeria sneezes, West Africa catches a cold. So you're basically looking at a country where. Um, when there are when there are conflicts, when there are concerns like this, it has regional implications. And I think it's also important in the approach that we take, that the US government takes and other partners working in Nigeria should take as they look at violent conflict in the country, understanding that this is something that has regional um, ramifications and it also needs a collective approach in trying to uh, resolve in trying to resolve it. We've seen the conflicts, the, we've seen the Boko Haram uh, conflicts, as I mentioned earlier, conflicts that started at a local level, a local, uh, a local level have blown up to have more national and regional um, implications. And along those lines too as well, as we think about how we approach um, these issues is also thinking about the Nigerian elections as they come up in 2023. The risk for violence is high. These elections are going to be happening in an environment where in a very complex security environment compared to what we saw in 2019 or in 2015. And the stakes are much higher now. And depending on the outcome of those elections, the, the, the outcome of those elections could have, there could be implications for the region. If those elections go well, the implications for, for what it means for strengthening democracy across West Africa, the example that Nigeria would set if those elections go well would be positive. If the, is, there is violence and there, the, uh, the elections, if there are is violence associated with those elections, the implications of that as well in, in the region uh, could be far reaching. Thank you. Thank you. If I, if I may, I'd like to um, go to, go to uh, Commissioner Steven Schneck uh, for comments and questions. Uh, thank you, Chair Turkel. Uh, I have uh, uh, two uh, uh, questions. The, uh, the first question I'd like to address to Mr. Uh, Agbudu. Um, Mr. Agbudu, you mentioned the, uh, as a proposed uh, uh, step in the right direction, an effort to train uh, local faith leaders and local leaders in conflict resolution. And I'm, I'm curious what that program would look like. Could you, would you say a few words about, about how that might be shaped? <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Steven. Uh, I would like to say uh, the recommendation given to train uh, religious leaders and local leaders, uh, we discovered that in this part of the country, a lot of people listening to their religious leaders a lot. And also uh, the local leaders are very close to the people and uh, where the presence of the state is not there, these people rely on the local leaders to help in resolving disputes. And they already have a local structure, conflict uh, mitigation structure in the community where people identify certain local leaders or religious leaders that they meet whenever they have issues. On, uh, on our program, which is the Community Initiatives to Promote Peace, are uh, funded by USID, is a five-year program to mitigate violent conflict in uh, northern Nigeria. That is three in the North Central, three states in the North Central, and three states in the Northwest. Uh, we, 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 we train local leaders and giving them the capacity where they will be able to manage disputes that are in their communities. So we, we select local leaders ranging from community leaders, youth leaders, women leaders, and opinion leaders to make sure that they have the mediation and negotiation skills such that when people come and uh, to meet them, 
they'll be able to resolve this dispute. So in the situation where these people have their capacity and the local structure is being strengthened, uh, it will help to minimize a lot of uh, conflicts that escalate from maybe just uh, some, uh, some words and uh, from people, like uh, also strength, uh, strengthening the early warning, early response six, uh, system, because we have people that we call the community peace observers. These community peace observers are being trained in making sure that they take note of some signals of violent trends that are going on in the community so that they'll be able to report it to the, the, the respectful uh, authorities so that these authorities now will be able to take, uh, uh, to, we'll be able to respond on time before these uh, violent issues or the threats or signals escalate into violent conflict. So if uh, local leaders and religious leaders, their capacity mm -hmm. is being strengthened in, uh, in mediation and negotiation, they will have the capacity to be able to mediate any type of uh, dispute that is uh, brought before them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I, in, 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 you know, because of time, I, I, I won't, uh, won't extend this too much. I very much applaud the idea of, of efforts to develop civil society within Nigeria. And I think the focusing on faith leaders is a particularly effective way uh, to do that. And uh, if I could say very briefly, I think uh, this uh, uh, dovetails pretty well with Ms. Uh, uh, Adabogu's uh, a suggestion to focus on uh, the youthful population. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Chair Turkel. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Schenek. If I may uh, um, go to uh, Commissioner Yulin next. Thank you very much, Chairman, and appreciate very much today our witnesses. They've provided a lot of great information to consider for all of us here at USER. So thank you very much for your time with us today. Two quick questions in the interest of time. One, I'm curious from any of our witnesses, and thank you very much for bringing up the, the issue of impunity this morning at our hearing. I'm curious as well as to whether or not there has been any government complicity in some of these uh, instance, instances of violence here. Uh, especially in the past couple of years. And then second, I'd also like any witness to, to uh, give us a, a thought if, as some of the presentation this morning has, has attempted to make clear, a lot of this violence is not religiously motivated, why is it the case that many of the victims inside Nigeria with whom at least I've had a chance to speak to believe that part of the motivation for the violence against them is indeed religiously grounded. Thanks very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. I, I um, <clears throat> now I'd like to ask um, Commissioner David uh, Curry to uh, comment and ask questions. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thank you to the witnesses uh, for your feedback. Uh, it's sort of building on Eric's, uh, uh, Commissioner Yulin's question. I, I suppose I'm particularly interested in Mr. Barnett's answer or Mr. Obudu. Uh, when you refer to uh, regional conflicts like the Fulani and so forth, in many cases I'm aware of, they claim, they claim an ideology is driving them, a theology of sorts. So when I hear comments that uh, it's not religiously motivated and, and, and the people on the ground think it is, is it, is it the case that, the, that they're stating an ideology? I mean, that's the feedback I've been getting that they say they believe that um, Christians are apostates or infidels uh, and likewise uh, moderate Muslims uh, who don't believe in their extreme versions of ideology are are targets and justified targets. Uh, so maybe you could comment on that as it relates to some of your your observations. Thank you. Yeah, I can um, can people hear me? I can I can take a stab at that initially. Sure. 
Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll keep my camera off to conserve bandwidth. It's a bit fickle here in Dakar, sorry. Um, I think I, I can talk uh, mostly to the kind of the Northwestern, probably can speak more North Central. Um, you know, to the extent that the bandits, uh, and that's, you know, the term that we're kind of using for um, predominantly Fulani militant, uh, you know, criminal groups in the Northwest, to, to the extent that they have an ideology, you know, I've found uh, kind of in, in all my research on that they really don't talk about religion. What they talk about is ethnicity. And so it's very true, especially, you know, the bandits can, uh, they can be very kind of, and so you're trying to kick the Fulani out of Nigeria. Well, we'll show, we're going to take over. We're going to do this. And, you know, I think it's important to keep in mind that sometimes this rhetoric can kind of verge on taunting. So, for example, I've heard recordings of bandits, you know, telling people, telling abducted uh, um, people that they've abducted or talking to the families of them saying, ah, yes, you know, I'm Boko Haram. We're going to be in Abuja soon. We're going to be in Lagos soon. But you find out that the bandit who did this, he's just some teenager. He doesn't know anything about Boko Haram. Um, famously, the, the Kankara abduction, the abduction of over 300 school children in Kassina State in December 2020, which was claimed by Abu Bakr Shakao um, and, and the Boko Haram group, as, a, as my colleagues and I showed in our study by actually interviewing Keys on this, the, the kidnapping was actually carried out by a bandit who, did, who decided that he would get a higher ransom payment if he allowed Boko Haram to claim the attack because the government would be more concerned and more scared about Boko Haram terrorism than about, you know, some Fulani militia in Katsina state. And so sometimes what we've seen is that the bandits will kind of use this uh, appearance of a religious or a radical ideology in terms to, in, in, as a way to kind of inflate their stature. Um, you know, one thing I'll say to kind of the, the broader point, um, I believe it was Commissioner Eric, uh, Commissioner Uland, um, you know, the truth is that I don't begrudge anyone, particularly particularly someone who is a religious minority, um, you know, in, in, in a Nigerian state for kind of fearing that there is a conspiracy here. Um, I don't need to go into all of the history, but of course, there is a very fraught history, particularly in these middle belt states, over kind of the question of whether the communities would be more, quote unquote, the South or, quote unquote, the North. And so there's a lot of history here that you have to kind of be aware of. And so it's, you know, I don't begrudge anyone for feeling, especially when there's such high, like there's such high level kind of state failure and it's repeated. Um, when, okay, it's a conspiracy. But that said, you know, when you go and you look at the research and you compare communities, the, the, the picture that's painted is more that this is kind of a failed support and violence across the board rather than at one particular community. Um, you know, just to conclude very quickly, I'll say, you know, in the Northwest as well, you will hear victims who will say, uh, we Hausa are being persecuted more than anyone else. And then the Fulani will say, ah, oh, we Fulani are, are being persecuted more than anyone else. They're not even talking about the violence happening and say, uh, you know, Northern Plateau State between, you know, Irigwe and, and Fulani or whatever. So I think that there's often a sense of victimhood in each community that's not necessarily wrong, but it doesn't give you the whole picture. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to recognize uh, Commissioner Fred Davey for comments and questions, possibly. Thank you, Chair Terkel. Um, and just a quick comment to say that um, uh, I de definitely appreciate the analysis that uh, suggests that <clears throat> perhaps a lot of what's going on is not uh, necessarily religiously uh, motivated violence, but violence that's uh, rooted more in ideology and in some cases uh, just kind of day-to-day -day survival, particularly when it comes to uh, the bandits and, and maybe some others. But that said, there is still a profound perception, at least among uh, the Christian leaders I spoke with there, that uh, there is a concerted effort with the government mm -hmm. being implicit to, um, to inflict uh, harm, if not um, uh, to try to eradicate the, the the presence and the strength of Christianity in in Nigeria. So I I I I I want to emphasize it because if you have major leaders uh, who have that perception and feel like that's real, then it's a serious issue for the government and others and and this commission as well as U.S. government to address. So I just I I want to put a pen and and mark that as as a serious issue. My question would be. Uh, and and the uh, the speakers uh, can also come in on that that statement. But my question would be: 
we've recommended, USERF has recommended, in addition to CPC status, the appointment of a uh, of a special envoy to the region. Mm -hmm. uh, let's let's say Lake Tra Chad region for the sake of our discussion today. And I'd be curious as to what our speakers uh, think about that recommendation. And I want to thank each of them for their contributions today. Thank you, Chair Turkett. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Davey. And I am going to uh, respond. My, my response will touch a little bit on, on the question that Commissioner Eric had as, as well on um, government complicity in the um, in the ongoing issues in, in Nigeria. I can't necessarily speak to government complicity in any of these issues, but I think as we see conversations ongoing, increased insecurity in Nigeria over time has led to ongoing debates on whether Nigeria, as Commissioner Wolf mentioned, uh, if Nigeria is a failed state or not a failed state. I think going beyond those labels, I think it's important for us to think about um, the state failure in Nigeria over time and how political actors may have benefited from a system that works for a few and leaves out a majority. And if you've been able to engage in this system um, over time without consequences, you have individuals that continue to perpetrate a, a system that, um, that, that works for the few and leaves out the majority. I think as we look across every part of Nigeria today, beyond the North going into the Southern parts of the country, there are pockets of violence in every part, in every region of Nigeria. Groups and communities feel levels of frustration or grievances across every part of Nigeria. And I think this is something that is pertinent for us to keep in mind that as we engage in these communities, it's important for peace building efforts to understand why some of these communities are aggrieved <clears throat> and also be able to help open a path for the Nigerian government to engage more effectively with these groups. Because from some of these groups, with some of these grievances, these easily become <clears throat> breeding grounds for extremist ideas. And I think for the first time we're seeing in Nigeria that there are grievances in every single part of the country. As we go into 2023, religion will actually, religion always plays a, a key, a, always, a, always has a key point of conversations around, around elections in Nigeria, but more so with these elections as we go into 2023, as we've seen the um, major political part or the incumbent political party filled two candidates from the same religious uh, background. That in itself is raising conversations, which also puts into uh, perspective the, the, the fragility that exists within the Nigerian environment, that discussions, rather than discussions being on the broader issues that political actors or those who, who seek to foment um, uh, violence or disrupt the system are narrowing some of these conversations down to religion. So it also shows how, how religion and discussions around religion could be used as tools to motivate violence. Needless to say, as I mentioned in my testimony, there are conflicts and there is violence in Nigeria, it's important for us to understand that there is violence in Nigeria that can be exclusively attributed to religion. There is also violence in Nigeria where it's important for us to understand when religion is just used as a tool to as as a as a as a tool to motivate um, disruption or to motivate crisis. So for us, being able to understand and differentiate between the two of them enables and helps inform our approach and ensure that we're not creating more damage in the system, but actually uh, uh, trying to address 
the situation, addressing the situation, because at the end of the day, while the responsibility to address these issues rest on the Nigerian state, the brunt, those who have to shoulder the brunt of these crises are the Nigerian people at the end of the day. So it's important for us to um, understand how these different conflicts manifest and ensure that that helps to inform our, our discourse and also help inform um, how the US government engages in, in the region. Thank you very much. We are getting close to the end of this hearing. I'd like to give the commissioners another um, chance if any of you would like to ask uh, follow-up questions or make additional comments. Uh, Please. Uh, Chair Terkel, very quickly. Um, I'm really impressed by the diversity of opinion that we've heard today. The technological end of things could have been a lot better. And if we can just ask uh, from the people who reported uh, from Africa, if they can perhaps give us <clears throat> some additional or expand on their written testimony, because the, the information perspective from better engagement with religious leaders to a better understanding of the terrorist actors, really crucial information uh, for all of us and for the broader uh, civil society NGO community to know about. So if we can prevail on the witnesses <clears throat> to expand in writing and for that information to be uh, you know, fully presented on our website, I think that would be uh, really helpful across the board. Anyone else has comments? Additional follow-up questions? If, if not, I'd like to ask our panelists to share any final thoughts um, helping us to conclude today's uh, hearing. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I would like to add this that uh, from our findings, we discovered that interreligious violence has been perpetrated by both and on both Muslims and Christians, and Christians appear to have suffered more attacks on revenge, and likely as a result, they were more likely to report feeling victimized. Yet a majority of Muslim and Christian respondents uh, said that <clears throat> members of both faiths are responsible for violence in their area, as opposed to uh, pinning blame solely on one side. So I would like to stress uh, that many of those conversations in which these conflicts are framed as uh, purely interreligious, they occur at the national and international level and become politicized. But that does not necessarily and massively affect the specific community level conflict dynamics. That's why we see the uh, uh, we, uh, that was why we see that despite this narrative in national media, most community members uh, across religious divide they decline to attribute uh, their uh, culpability for the conflicts to one side and are citing other drivers of conflict as more instrumental. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Onobogo. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to say thank you again for the opportunity to testify and to stress uh, one of the recommendations that I had on a focus on focusing on accountable governance in Nigeria. I think over time we have seen conflicts emerge in Nigeria and Nigeria move from one conflict to another. And these conflicts manifest themselves in different ways across the country. For us to be able to ensure that we get to the root causes of, the, of these conflicts, it is important that we focus on strengthening those institutions of governance that can lead to the sustainable change that we hope and we wish to see. And hopefully as we move towards the elections in 2023, this provides an opportunity for the US government to have more timely focused and consistent support towards those elections. Because not only the elections itself, but whoever emerges as president of Nigeria will be governing a country that is dealing with multiple 
challenges, multiple security challenges, and how we engage with the government that emerges after the elections is also important. So thank you again for, for this opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Any other witnesses yeah, wanted to thank make you. your point? So, Go ahead, please. Yeah. So thank you very much, Chair Turkel. Um, and yeah, thank you. I'd like to, to echo what both of my uh, my fellow witnesses have said. Um, and I think uh, this is uh, related to Commissioner Davies' last point, which I think he, he got to uh, kind of the truth of the matter. And one of the big challenges is that these these narratives they exist in Nigeria and they're very sincerely held and you know the people they're not uh, they have their reasons for believing them they as as um, uh, you know as as Ms. Onumu mentioned right uh, the people feel victimized in every community and they have reasons for feeling that and I think that the um, it's important to recognize that narrative can both be kind of uh, sincere and 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 based in some reality, but also not capture the full nuances of this country. And I think so I would just like to end by by pointing out or by kind of uh, reminding uh, the commission and everyone that Nigeria is a very complex uh, country and that often this violence rooted in local causes is kind of swept up in these larger national narratives. And so I think that one of the things that the commission has done, such as uh, you know, sending uh, delegations to Nigeria to hear from different stakeholders is very important because it's important to understand the local nuances uh, of each of these these challenges that Nigeria faces, and then to see how each of these local challenges um, is both, uh, as as my you know the other witnesses noted, the, these local challenges are rooted in some of the same kind of structural problems, and they also feed into some of the same narratives and beliefs and perceptions about Nigeria as a failed state or something like that. So I think that understanding that the connection between local nuance and the national discourse and the national factors uh, is, is crucial. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? I'm going to just thank uh, Mr. Barnett for meeting with us while we were there. Uh, he provided us a lot of valuable information during the delegation's visit to Nigeria. So I want to thank him for that. And also to say that he's produced, uh, in addition to the material we got today, uh, some other analysis that was shared while we were in Nigeria. And I commend that to my fellow commissioners. Thank you very much. Um, I um, This hearing is coming to an end. Uh, before we close, I wanted to thank uh, our witnesses um, for coming to testify, sharing their expertise. Um, and um, I'm, I'm grateful for the uh, compelling testimonies uh, that our witnesses provided today, educating us. And also um, those in the uh, policy circle in our government uh, to, to do the right thing, uh, call it what it is. I um, also wanted to thank our commissioners um, uh, who participated in today's hearing, uh, taking the time from their busy schedule. Um, I'm particularly grateful for our two commissioners based in California uh, starting so early uh, to be able to join us in this hearing. And I can't miss this opportunity to uh, thank our uh, professional staff team, policy experts and, and the communications team for the hard work to arrange uh, today's hearing. I also wanted to apologize to the audience for the technical difficulties that we experienced. Um, and finally, I wanted to reiterate um, our position. Uh, this is a bipartisan commission. Those of you who are tuning in uh, may have noticed that even despite the fact that the commission is being appointed by different political parties, we are laser focused in our effort uh, to uh, educate the public about uh, religious persecution in various parts of the world. We also uh, strongly advocate strong um, principle uh, foreign policy, uh, including uh, religious freedom, human rights concerns, so that we could continue to be moral leader in the world, uh, lending our voices to those uh, millions of voiceless people around the world. And uh, as we have been consistently recommended uh, State Department should designate Nigeria as a country of particular concern for engaging in uh, and tolerating systematic ongoing egregious religious freedom violations. We also call on uh, the US government uh, to appoint a special envoy so that we will have a full-time professional uh, leader 
to uh, to stop the uh, human rights abuses, religious persecution uh, in Nigeria. Um, as uh, uh, Commissioner Frank Wolf of, often says, we need to continue to be truth teller. And that's what we are doing today with this hearing. With that, uh, this hearing is adjourned.